everybody, I'm Jennifer, the Woodwind TA from Yosel, and um, I'm just going to be giving you basically um, an overview of the history of the flute. Um, it's one of the oldest instruments. In fact, some people wonder if it's the oldest instrument. Um, the first ones were discovered in German caves, and they're thought to be about 35,000 years old. And they looked more like ocarinas than the flutes that we're used to seeing today. And they were made out of bone with just a couple of holes in them. So you couldn't play very many notes at all with these flutes. Um, but that's kind of where the flutes got their start. Then from there, people were constantly improving them, coming up with ways for them to be easier to play and for them to be able to play more notes. Um, in the second century, was the first time that we um, know of that people had flutes that were played out to the side like we see in the orchestra today. Those we call um, transverse flutes. And those were seen in ancient Greece and then in India and China and Japan. Then um, sometime later, around the 11 or 1200s, Flutes were used primarily uh, for courtly music, military calls, and marches. But in the Renaissance, it was a really popular instrument for just regular people to play at home with their families. Then in about the 16th century, composers thought that the flute was so cool and they wanted to write all of this repertoire for it that was really demanding, lots of notes, and it became harder and harder to play that music on the flutes that existed at the time. The flutes at that time were made out of wood and they typically only had one key on them. The rest were just holes like we would see on a recorder. Um, so there were lots of difficult fingerings that you had to do. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a recorder to show you on, but they'd have to use things like cross fingerings, things like this, where you're putting down this finger, then leaving this one up and putting this one down, or on the opposite hand like this. It's just really awkward fingering when you're trying to do really fast um, passage work in a piece. So flute makers around the world were looking for ways to make it easier to play the music that was being written for the instrument. So naturally, um, instrument makers around the world started adding more and more keys to the flute. First there were three keys, then there were six, then there were eight, then somebody tried eleven. People tried different materials, like instead of making it just out of wood, people tried glass flutes and metal flutes and I think even porcelain flutes. They were just experimenting with anything, seeing what worked to make it easier to play the music that was being written at the time. So by um, the early 20th century, in the 1900s, the eight-keyed flute was the one that kind of was sticking. It seemed like that was, you know, as good as it was going to get. Um, and then this guy, Theobald Bohm, who was a flute player and inventor, came into the picture. And this guy is responsible for the key mechanism that we have today. He was a genius of the 19th century. Um, so, in about 1832, he created this completely new key system that looks much like what we see on um, clarinets and oboes today. They have the closed keys and then ring keys, open ring keys, um, to make it easier for venting so you don't have to cover only half of a hole like you might do on an instrument more similar to a recorder. So this key system um, also was an innovation because it went from attaching one key at a time to the instrument all separately attached to attaching them to a rod so that they can be removed in pieces and they worked um, together as a unit like we now have on modern flutes. And this is also how modern clarinets and oboes and bassoons are put together. This same key system was so revolutionary, it was adopted by all woodwind instrument makers. So um, we went from, you know, Kind of primitive hard to play flute to an incredibly advanced flute in a very short period of time and as if that wasn't enough 
this guy just kept inventing and kept improving a new flute he came out with in um, about 1845-1847. And then just three years after that, he invented another instrument, the alto flute, which is basically a bigger version of a normal flute. As you can see here, it's just longer and lower and it's in the key of G instead of C, which I'll demonstrate a little bit later. So all of that happened in the late 1800s, and from there, um, the improvements that we've seen for the flu kind of went in a new direction. People um, that are making flutes now still look for ways to make flutes work better, make it easier for flute players to play really difficult repertoire because um, composers all over the world love to write um, really, in, really um, technically intense music for the flute. So people do things like creating new kinds of pads, which are the, thing, the things that help seal underneath the keys there, or making um, pinless mechanisms and things like that that are really complicated and, you know, um, scientifically beyond even my comprehension. They just make the food work easier for everybody. Then, with um, more modern music, people wanted to play not just the regular notes that we see, like flats and sharps, the black and white keys of the piano, but they wanted to play quarter tones, which is halfway between like an F and an F sharp. There's a note in between there. That would be a quarter tone. So, um, the Kingma system came out of that, which is a completely new key system. Um, it was developed like within the last, I want to say, 20 years or so. It's a very new system. And it has a bunch of different new keys that make it really easy for flutists to play quarter tones. Um, I'm going to link a YouTube video so that if you want to um, watch a demonstration of that. If you're fascinated by this, you can go ahead and watch that. I highly recommend it. It's super cool. There was also this other new invention. Um, it's called the glissando head joint, and it basically allows the flutist to slide between notes, and it sounds like a trombone sliding down. This, again, is such a cool invention and people use it all the time for modern flute music. So I'll link a video that demonstrates that as well. It's so fascinating to watch and I really recommend looking at it because it's really, really cool. So um, one thing we didn't talk about was the piccolo. This is the highest instrument that you'll hear in the orchestra. As promised, I'm going to show you how the alto flute is in a different key. So I'm going to play that same thing that I just played on the flute, and you'll see how different it sounds. Mm -hmm. 